but I flew in yesterday from the great golden state of California. I knew that would press some buttons. Y'all need to be fasting and in prayer because it ain't looking good. I know we was up 2-0 against, you know, we were down 2-0 against Phoenix. This ain't Phoenix, dog. This ain't, this kind only comes out by fasting and prayer. <laughs> Anyways, what a joy. It's always so good to be with you all. 400 people being added to the church this weekend. Give God praise all over this place. Man, it's just a testament to God's hand is resting on this house. Yes, we give God praise for our pastor, Pastor Conway, his wife, gifted leadership, but gifted people are a dime a dozen, anointed people. Now, that's rare. Amen. And the favor of God that is on them, that is on this house, uh, I trust you are praying for them constantly, all the time. If you have your Bibles, I want you to meet me in the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter Three is where we're going to be uh, in, in God's word today, Hosea, Hosea chapter, chapter 3. Father, we need to hear a word from you today. We don't need to hear the thoughts of a middle-aged man. We need to hear from an eternal God. I believe, Lord God, when Adam and Eve were looking for a fig leaf to hide under, you ordained, you appointed each and every person in this room at the various campuses online to engage in this mes message because you want to release a word into your people. So it's a humbling thing, Lord God, that you would use me as your mouthpiece at this moment. And as the old African-American preachers often say, I need you to stand in my body and think with my mind and speak with my tongue. Edit out every, anything that attracts undue attention to myself. Edit in everything that magnifies and glorifies your name. It's in Jesus' name I ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Dr. Tony Evans tells the story of the time in which a young man sat down to have a conversation with an elderly woman in her home. Not long into the conversation, the young man noticed that there was a coffee table situated between he and this elderly woman, and on that coffee table was a dish uh, filled with what looked like the most delightful, delectable peanuts he'd ever seen in his life. These peanuts looked off the chain. They were distracting him. So as Dr. Tony Evans tells it, uh, here this elderly woman is, she's just kind of pouring out her heart uh, to this young man, and the young man stops her and says, yeah, dear, dear, dear woman, I, I just got to tell you, uh, I, I hate to cut you off, but these peanuts look off the chain, and I don't want to just be presumptuous and just grab some, but I, I just want to ask you, do you mind if I have some of your peanuts? Now, she didn't just give an immediate yes. She actually paused and thought about it, which was kind of curious to this young man. Like, what in the world's going on here? And after a few seconds, she acquiesced, and um, she commenced to uh, pouring out her heart while he just reached into the dish and popped some of the peanuts into his mouth. And a few moments later, much to his horror, he looked down and realized that all the peanuts were gone. And so he just cut this woman off again. He says, ma'am, I'm so sorry. My mama raised me so much better than this. Here I am, a guest in your house, and I done ate up all your peanuts. But I just got to tell you, they taste even better than they look. These peanuts are off the chain, and I've got to have some. Can you please tell me, ma'am, where you got these peanuts from? Well, this time she turns red, and she pauses even longer. It feels like she pauses for uh, 30 seconds to a minute. In reality, it was probably 10 seconds. And he's just kind of thinking, man, what's up with this woman and these peanuts? You would think that I was asking her for a $10,000 loan. Finally, in answer to his question, where did you get these peanuts from? This elderly woman says, young man, as you can see, I'm an older person. And as such, I have no teeth. <laughs> these peanuts used to be covered in chocolate. But because I have no teeth, I just <laughs> suck the chocolate off and spit the peanuts back into the bowl. The moral of the story is, where are you going, preacher? Where are you going? The moral of the story is not everything is as it appears. And what's true of once chocolate-covered peanuts, I fear, is true of so many people who think they're saved. But in reality, they are not. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus 
is nearing the end of his great Sermon on the Mount. It's a chapter in which the great London preacher D. Martin Lloyd-Jones calls the most harrowing chapter in all of the New Testament. Jesus says these words thinking of the religious elite. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He then says, on that day, many will come to me saying, did we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out many demons in your name? Didn't we do many mighty works in your name? And Jesus says to them, depart from me, I never knew you. The great tragedy of hell is hell will not just be filled with irreligious people. It will be filled with many religious people who came to church, sang on the praise team, preached in pulpits, led community groups, were deacons, were elders. Just because you come to church and hold a title of leadership doesn't make you saved any more than you standing in your car makes you a garage. As my grandmama used to say, not everybody talking about heaven is going. It was the great C.S. Lewis who once said in the lecture there at Oxford University, he says, when we get to heaven, we will be surprised on two fronts. One, we will be surprised at who is there that we knew for sure would not be there. But two, he says, we'll be surprised at who ain't there that we knew for sure would be there. Not everybody talking about heaven is going, and this is a word for us in the Bible Belt. Just because you have a quiet time, does it make you Christian? Just because you come to church at 8 o'clock in the morning, this is the spiritual crowd, doesn't make you saved. So how do I know that I'm saved? Jesus says at the end of scaring the living daylights of the religious elite, he says, this is how you know you're saved. He says, you shall recognize them, I love it, by their fruit. Fruit is a changed and changing lifestyle that cannot be blamed on the normal maturation process of adulthood, but can only be blamed on the indwelling power of the Spirit of God pulsating through our yielded lives. In other words, everyone who is shown enough saved, to quote my grandmother, should be able to look through the rearview mirror of their journey with Jesus and conclude two things. One, I have not arrived yet. I ain't perfect. That's why we used to sing a a song in my little chocolate church on the south side of Atlanta growing up. Please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. But we should also be able to conclude that while I have not arrived, when I look through the rearview mirror of my journey with Jesus, I am not where I used to be. He is changing me. I think I shared this this with you uh, uh, some months back when I was here, sort of like my my pastor announced to his church one Sunday. He said in front of 13,000 people, I don't mind sharing it with you. He says, you know, when I first got saved, I used to cuss at the drop of a hat. But now since following Jesus, I don't cuss that fast anymore. He's not condoning cursing, but what is he saying, man? You, you cut me off on the freeway, and I haven't had my cup of coffee in my time with the Lord. I might pull up next to you and speak to you in sign language. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm not where I used to be. It, can anybody just give praise that he's changing <laughs> me? Jesus says, you shall recognize them by their fruit. Well, what is fruit? Paul answers it for us in Galatians chapter 5 when he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Please hear me. It's interesting that the leadoff batter to the list is love. It's a question there in a little upper room overlooking the Kidron Valley, Jesus Announced this to his disciples in John chapter 13. By this will all men know that you're my disciples. Not by the arguments you have on Facebook. Not by your ability to articulate fine points of theology. Not by the amazing quiet time streak that you're on. Not by your giving record. But by this will all people know that you are my show enough real deal followers. By the love that you have for one another. Uh, Paul would say this to the Corinthians in a passage many of us have had read at our weddings. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, Now abide in faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So the New Testament screams that an unloving Christian is an oxymoron. 
It is a contradiction in terms. To be unloving and to call yourself Christian is to be at war with the centrality of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Oh, may they call you a lot of things. but May they never call us unloving. But now this introduces the question, what is it? What does it mean to love? This is such a term that we throw out. In fact, if you Google the term love, over 5 billion hits. What does it mean to love? Love is almost like a, like a Cheeto. If I were to ask you to define for me what a Cheeto is, you couldn't tell me. But you know it when you see it. That's love. It's hard to define. But we know it when we see it. There's a great Robert Smith Jr., that great seminary professor who said this, every New Testament point has an Old Testament picture. We've been making the point about love, and it's the badge of the believer authenticating our witness to a lost and dying world. But now I want to end by wrestling with the question, what does love look like? Because if the primacy of love means that this is what it, what, what it means to authenticate my witness to the world, I have to then assume that when I stand in the presence of God, he is going to hold me accountable for whether or not I lived a loving life. But what does that mean? What does it look like to love now we're in Hosea? When we come to Hosea, God is peering over the balcony of heaven, and he does not like what he sees. For he is, he is married to his bride, Israel. And Israel is being unfaithful. In fact, in chapter 1, he calls Hosea to a closed-door meeting, and he says to the prophet, Hosea, we've got a problem. I am married to Israel. I am in covenant with Israel, not contract. Contracts are performance-based. Contracts are, you do your part, some of you all are in sales, and you sign the contract, and you hit your numbers, you get the bonus, but Lord help you, if you don't perform, you're now looking for another job. That's the nature of contracts. They, they are performance-based. That's not covenant. Covenant is a, is a commitment it's a ride or die. When you got married, you, you didn't enter into contract. You entered into covenant. And the problem with so many marriages is you're in covenant, but you're behaving as if it's contract. So many marriages say this is a 50-50 proposition. You do your part. I'll do my part. I'll meet you halfway. But the problem is anyone who says I'll meet you halfway is normally a poor judge of distance. The very nature of marriage means there are seasons when your spouse ain't meeting you halfway. There are seasons when you ain't meeting them halfway. And love makes up the difference in the distance. Paul says, this ain't, God says, this ain't 50-50. You couldn't even take a step towards me. I'm in covenant with you. I'm, I'm ride or die with you. But he says, my problem is I'm married. I'm in covenant to my bride Israel. And he says this, God's words, and yet they are whoring after other gods. By the way, every time we sin, we whore after other gods. Every time we sin, we commit spiritual adultery. Because in essence, the, 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 the nature of sin is saying, God, you're not enough. God, I am not looking to you for fulfillment. I'm going to look around you to find fulfillment in spite of you. So I'll find it in sex. I'll, I'll find it in money. I'll find it in status. I'll find it in my children. I'll find it in people pleasing. The very nature of sin is spiritual adultery. God says, that's not my real problem. My, my real problem is not that my bride is cheating on me. My real problem is, is that in my holiness, mercy, and grace, even though they've given me license to divorce them, I cannot divorce them. And so, Hosea, I, I need to show my people that I have more mercy than they have mess. I, I, I need to show them that as far as the east is from the west is as far as I have removed their sins from them. 
I need to show them that, that my grace will never come back insufficient funds. And I want to use you, Hosea, to communicate what it looks like to love someone. Hosea's like, okay, God, what are you thinking? You, you, want, me to, you, may, you want me to preach a sermon? Ah, that may come later. Okay, God, what do you think? You mean to, you mean to write a book? Ah, you'll do that later. But Hosea, I want to use you as my divine show and tell for how I love people. Ho- Hosea, I, 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 I know you just graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. I know you've You've got the master's degree. I, 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 know, I know you've just gotten called to a church. Uh, I also know that you're single, Hosea. I got a bride picked out for you. Oh, can't you see Hosea? Excited now. He's, he's smiling. And maybe Hosea says, well, God, tell me, what is her name? Her name, God says, is Gomer. Now, let me just stop you right there. I ain't smiling anymore if I'm Hosea because I ain't never met a cute Gomer in my life. <laughs> no offense if your mama named you Gomer. Okay, God, well, 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 what does she do? Chapter 1, she's a prostitute. I can see Hosea backing away. The countenance has shifted. No, 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 God, I got this insulation coming up, and I'm going to walk down the center aisle. Can't you just imagine the sight, the prophet with a prostitute, the man of God with a Woman of the night, God, that's too strange of a sight. And God says that's exactly the point, Hosea. And if you think it's strange that a prophet would be called to marry a a prostitute, I can do you one stranger. The fact that I, a holy God, stoop so low as to be with you is an even stranger sight. What does this teach us about love? If it never gets strange, it ain't love. What makes love pop is the contrast. That's the beauty of marriage. God putting two completely different people together who have different worldviews on the on the toilet seat. <laughs> Different philosophies on, the, on how to squeeze the toothpaste. And one does it correctly from the bottom up and the other does it incorrectly from the middle. One's a morning person, one's an evening person, one's frugal or cheap with the money. The, 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 the other just spends it like it's going out of style. He says, yeah, I'm calling you together because what makes love pop is the contrast. In fact, if you're married to someone, y'all never argue, fuss, or fight. Y'all think exactly alike on every single thing. One of y'all ain't necessary. So so God says, I'm going to put two opposites together and tether you with love and call you to walk this thing out. It's, It's strange. I've told you about my youngest son. He thinks he's God's gift to basketball. I told you how I'm holding on to all these receipts. I remember pastoring in the Bay Area, not too far from where the Warriors play. Just have that word in my spirit. We had just gotten there. My, my son's a two guard, and we bought a house in San Jose, and he gets picked up by this great AAU team. First tournament is in San Francisco. My son's the two guard. So we pack our things up, drive up 280 North, go to San Francisco, and we sit down at the tournament all day Saturday next to the point guard on our team's parents. Two women who are married to each other. This was strange for me. They're holding hands, showing public displays of affection. Um, I grew up in Atlanta in the 80s. And let me just say, Atlanta in the 80s, a lot different than Atlanta now. <laughs> this was strange. So, so we get to know them. We, we ask them, well, how did you all meet? And tell us about your, your marriage. You're just kind of interacting with them. And at the end of the tournament, we get their number. And th- then, then my wife and I and our youngest son hop in the car and 
and we're driving now about an hour back to, back to the house down the 280 South. And my, my wife and I are talking about this couple. They, they had left and made an impression on us. And my wife and I kind of turned to each other and said, what if God is calling us not to change them? Because we can't even change ourselves. In fact, the call of God isn't to make people heterosexual, it's to make them holy. So what if God's calling us not to change them, but to love them? So we invited them over to our house. And, 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 and I remember they, they come in holding hands, just doing what a married couple does, and they're sitting down. It's, it's just strange to me. And, and, and we're asking them questions, and we find out over the course of the evening that they're atheists. They don't believe in God. We, 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 we find out what they do for a living. And the whole time I'm going, please don't ask me what I do <laughs> for a living. Talk about an awkward moment. And that evening they don't. In fact, the next couple of interactions that we have together at our house, at their house, it's just fun and, and, and interactive. And finally, towards the end of the fall uh, season, we, 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 we are at our home and they're over our house and we're enjoying good food, good drink. And, 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 and finally, finally, one of them yelled out, hey, Brian, we've been hanging out for a while now. We've never asked you what you do for a living. And you know what we do for a living, but, but we've never asked you, what do you do for a living? I'm thinking to myself, okay, here we go. Um, I'm a pastor who, who tells people how to find true meaning, value, and significance in life through God's only son, Jesus. One of them immediately got up from the, from the table, grabbed her purse, murmured under her breath, I didn't see that one coming, headed for the door, and I'm thinking to myself, and y'all call us Christians judgmental? But I couldn't say that because as a pastor, you can't say everything you're thinking. So I cracked a joke, diffused the situation, invited them back. We finished off our time together. Spring season now hits, and not long into the spring season, they call me up. They said, Brian, our, our, our son is 13 years old, as you know, and it's obvious he's getting to a place in his life where, where he's not responding to a woman's voice. And, and it's obvious that our son needs, needs a, a male voice that we trust to speak into his life. So what we've done is we've just gotten out of our lease agreement in our home there in Sunnyvale, and, and, and we've, we've just rented a house around the corner from you because we think you're that man who needs to be pouring into our son's life. No pressure. I'm like, I wish y'all would have told me that before you got out of your rental agreement. Then on that same phone call, they said, listen, we're just moving into this house. We're doing a housewarming thing. We'd love for you to come over and, and, and bless our home. Now, now, they're atheists. I said, bless as in talk to God? They said, do you. I said, okay, I'm going to do me. So I, I put some oil in my pocket after church. We loaded up, made a beeline over there, and, and from the sight, from the looks of things, we were the, me, my wife, my son, were the only heterosexual people in the joint. And God bless that youngest son of mine, he can't whisper to save his life. <laughs> Packed house, my son says, Dad, are you uncomfortable? <laughs> I'm like, shut up, boy, shut up. <laughs> I took my oil, I went straight for their bedroom. <laughs> Praying, laying hands on everything, dousing the place. <laughs> and I noticed the whole time this person is taking pictures of us. He's taking pictures the whole time. The next day, Monday, I'm in my office, and my wife sends me a text. Uh, Sweetheart, they done tagged us on Facebook. About an hour or two after that, an 80-something-year-old mother at our church called me. She said, Pastor, I was on Facebook. 
no offense, but when that's the lead-in from one of the mothers in the church, her words, not mine, her words, not mine. Is my pastor partying with homosexuals? Her words, not mine. Because the Jesus I know wouldn't, wouldn't party with homosexuals. Now, there's a verse in the Bible. If you were to say to me, you can cut one verse out of the Bible, it would be this verse. I would get rid of it because I have a problem with it. The verse says, do not rebuke an older person. I know a whole lot of older saints. They need to be rebuked. So I gathered all the respect I could. I said, Mother, you might want to read up on Jesus some more. Because the Jesus I know went out to some strange places and sat with some strange folk. He went to a woman at a well in John chapter 4, sat with her even though she'd been shacking up with five different men. And the sixth man that she was with wasn't her husband. And ain't it interesting? She's been with six different men, but was only the seventh man, Jesus. The number of completion that changed her life. Here is Jesus. He goes to parties with tax collectors and sinners, has his feet rubbed by prostitutes. He went to some strange places, hung out with some strange folks, shared the love of God and changed lives. And this makes me want to ask you, how strange are your friendships? The problem with the body of Christ is we, we, we're so tribal and birds of a feather flock together and we only do life if, if I'm a Republican with Republicans or if I'm a Democrat with Democrats. We need some strange folk at our dinner table that makes us uncomfortable so we can share the love of God. So not long after that, we, my, my wife and I, we're, we're at a tournament. They're watching our kids. And my wife and I talked about this. And so we went up to our friends, this, this gay couple. We said, it's a crazy idea, but we're about to go on family vacation. And here we are in the Bay Area. We're actually going to fly to New York City for a week. And then we're going to go down to a Christian camp just outside of Atlanta, at Atlanta for a week. And we'd love to take your son with us. We'll pay for everything. I know it's a crazy ask to take your child thousands of miles away, but, but we'd love to do that. And so if y'all need to think about it, talk about it, just let us know. They said, we don't need to think about it. He can go. So their son got on a plane with us, spent a week in New York City, eating good food, laughing, enjoying the sights. Then, then we went down to this camp just outside of Atlanta and had a wonderful time there. And this kid is watching us do family devotions and he's hearing the word. And the last night of camp, he comes up to me and, and he says, Mr. Loritz, do, 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 do you mind if we take a walk? And, and we go and we, we take a walk and he's pouring his heart out to me, 13 years old, and how much he misses his dad and why isn't his dad a part of his life? But he says, I've been watching you these, these couple of weeks, and, 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 and I just want to ask you a question. Can you show me how to be a follower of Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. So on that lighted path, we, we prayed the prayer, and he gave his life to Jesus, and then it happened. A couple days later, his, his mama called me. She said, I don't know what happened on that trip. But ever since my boy's been back, he's been carrying around a big Bible telling me I need Jesus. <laughs> she said, what's funny is we've been thinking about coming to your church. But I got a question for you, she said, because Christians have hurt us. Is your church safe? I said it's safe, but it ain't comfortable. And from the next Sunday on, when I baptized their son, every Sunday you would come in and see a strange sight. On the front row would be me, the pastor, sitting next to his wife, sitting next to a lesbian couple. Strange. And they both come.
come to know Jesus. What got their son on the plane? It wasn't my position paper on the gay community. It was love. What got them in church? It wasn't me telling them it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. What got them there was love. In fact, John says, when I saw Jesus, watch it now, hear the order. I saw a man full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Hear me, oftentimes people don't want to hear your truth until they first feel your grace. And I know some of y'all are freaking out. Your inner Pharisee is having a seizure. Just say it's wrong. Just say it's wrong. Tell me it's wrong. Tell me it's wrong. Tell me it's wrong. And let us remember, even as Roe versus Wade is about to be repealed, and I think abortion is horrible, and some of you all right now, you've had abortions. God's grace covers you. Let us remember we're not just dealing in the legal realm. These are women who need to be loved. We don't know how it happened, but it happened. Here's Hosea. He marries Gomer on the command of God. But when we come to chapter 3, they're separated. How do we know this? You don't need to spend a day in seminary to figure this out. When we come to our text, notice how God opens up in verse 1. He tells Hosea, go again. Go again. Translation, go get her. Translation, they're separated. Why are they separated? The text tells us she is an adulteress. She is, not was, not used to be. She is an adulteress, which means this. She cheated on him. She betrayed him. If I'm Jose, I'm like, a little heartbroken. I ain't want to be with her in the first place. This was your idea. I'm out. In fact, the Bible in the law gives me just cause to be out. I mean, she's lucky she ain't getting stoned. I'm done. I have the right to divorce her. And then God reminds him, remember, Hosea, your marriage ain't about your marriage, but your marriage is a window to the world for how I unconditionally love them. So here's what I need you to do, Hosea. I need you to go again because if ultimately at the end of the day, every time you messed up, I would wipe my hands clean of you, you wouldn't have made it out the first day. But the very fact that you and I have a relationship is that I do to you several times every single day what I'm calling you to do to her. Go again, and go again, and go again, and go again. That's what God does to us every single day. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. He goes again with us. We are alive today in relationship with God because he's gone again with us. So, verse 2, will you look at it with me? Notice the details. Hosea says, I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. Why the detail? Here's what's going on with Gomer. She's being sex trafficked right now. She's on the auction block. She's being objectified. She's being treated as a thing that exists for the gratification of men in a very misogynistic, patriarchal society. She's being sex trafficked. Now, why the detail? Why does it say, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley? Because the going rate to emancipate then a woman who was being trafficked was 30 shekels of silver. So why didn't it say, I bought her for 30 shekels of silver? Why does it say, I bought her for 15 shekels and a homer and a lethic of barley? The answer is, he didn't have 30 shekels. I, I can just see him now. Okay, God wants me to go get her. All I have is 15 shekels. He liquidates his, his accounts. He's maybe checking between the cushions and his sofas. All he has is 15 shekels. He goes to the auctioneer. This is all I have, 15 shekels. The auctioneer goes, not enough. Well, what if I added, he says, a, a homer and a lethic of barley. This is all I have. He says, I'll take it. Ain't it interesting to emancipate the one who wronged him, who cheated on him, literally cost him everything he had. And this is how you know you're loving someone. If you ain't paying a cost, it ain't love. 
But that's our problem. We want Nordstrom quality community at thrift store prices. We don't want to be inconvenienced. If you got kids, you know you pay a cost. Literally, figuratively, in every other way. I mean, it just kills me. One of my sons said to me, I, I can't wait till I get up out of here. And I'm thinking to myself, I can't wait for you to bounce too. <laughs> Again, you can't say everything you're thinking. But these arrogant, narcissistic kids have no idea the cost we pay. I don't need you to clap. That's what it means to be a parent. You pay a cost. You, you, you take on an extra job. You put up with all of this mess. You don't throw them out of the house. You pay a cost. And in some way, shape, or form, the body of Christ needs to bottle that up and pay a cost. It's been shameful how we've been treating each other. I'm a Republican. You're a Democrat. So I, I don't want anything to do with you. We're not paying a cost. You have different lifestyle choices than me. I want nothing to do with you. The last time I checked, Jesus died not just for heterosexuals. He died for the world. Who are you paying a cost for? Really? They gossiped about you one time, so you're done with them? Really? Really? They lied on you one time, so you're done with them? Really? Verse 2, he sets her free. Let's go home on this one. If I were to end this message right now, I would make love to be this spineless thing. I'd, I'd make us doormats. Just kind of walk over me. In fact, that's not love, that's tolerance. God doesn't call us to tolerate. What a low ethic. I tolerate you. He calls us to love. Love is strange. Love is costly. But verse 3 tells us love has a standard. After he emancipates her, look at it, look at it. And I said to her, you must not dwell as mine for many days. You must not, you shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. He says, look, I've set you free. I want you back. We can reconcile. But the only way this is going to work, this marriage is going to work, you can't be in them streets. Some of you all are trying to work it out with people who don't have a standard. They don't share your values. They're not committed to your Jesus. And this is a word that will free some of you. Some of you, the call is, that person cheated on you as your spouse. God is saying, I want you to actually give them another chance. They're manifesting the fruit of repentance. They're confessing. What a witness to the world. What a witness to the world. Others of you, he's releasing you from that marriage because this joker ain't showing any kind of repentance. You're freed. I knew I wasn't going to get an amen on that, but that's okay. <laughs> now watch the order. He emancipates her first. Then he gives her the standard. Had he given her the standard first, he would have made her emancipation predicated on works. But because he sets her free first and then gives her the standard, now her obedience is not in the category of duty but delight. I want to be faithful to this man who set me free. I, I, I want to be faithful. Listen, love has a standard, so, so let me set some of you Pharisees free. When, when, when our lesbian friends came to me at my house and said to me, hey, look, we're, we're celebrating five years of marriage. We want you, Brian, to do our vow renewal ceremony. I'm like, oof. I said to them, am I allowed to disagree with you? And not be accused of being a bigot? Or hating you? 
can I think differently with you on something and still love you? Don't buy into the lie of the culture. The culture says, unless you 100% agree, you can't love me. They don't have kids. <laughs> I don't agree with all of my kids' choices. I got one kid, man, I just, this culture, man, they, smoking weed is like a glass of wine. A <laughs> pastor done said too much. All right, get out of my business. <laughs> I disagree. But you're still coming to my house for vacation. This is the gospel. God sets us free first, and then he calls us to obedience second. This is what God does with Israel at the Red Sea. God doesn't say to Israel, hey, uh, you've got this Red Sea in front of you, but Here's Ten Commandments. Do those Ten Commandments first. I'll open up the Red Sea. That's not how God rolls. He opens up the Red Sea first and then gives them the Ten Commandments so that their obedience would be predicated in, in delight and not duty. Romans 2, 4 says of us, it is God's kindness that leads to repentance. It is never our repentance that leads to God's kindness. This is the gospel. And that's why I want to just end by telling you that I've been preaching this thing wrong to you. This text is not ultimately about how we love other people. This text is ultimately about how God loves us. And I want you to understand you will never love this way unless you rest on one singular truth. And that is Gomer is not just the person next to you. It's not just the person down the street, around the corner. We're all Gomer. We're all messed up. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. None of us bats a thousand. All of us have gone astray. All of us are sinners, which means this. You will never love people this way until you first get in touch with your inner gomer, until you first understand, I'm the one in need of mercy. I'm the one in need of grace. I'm the one. God's Hosea. He comes again with me. And so which means this, if you are cutting off people, if you're turning your back on them, if you want nothing to do with certain kinds of communities, you are a self-righteous legalistic stench who has lost touch with how far you've fallen. But for the grace of God, he hasn't thrown open the closet doors on your life as if you've gotten it right all the time. So what would it take for people to come to one community and church and go, that's the church that loves? We all say, I'm Gomer. I'm the messed up one. I'm a liar. I'm a gossip. I've coerced people to have abortions. I've had abortions. I'm greedy. I filed for bankruptcy until you get in touch with that. So, Father, I bless your people. By this will all people know that One Community Church are the real deal followers of you. It's not by the amount of conferences they do. It's not by who their pastor is. It's by the love that they have for one another. Oh, Father, I just speak love over this church. I speak love over every person here. God, help us to love. Show us who we need to go again with. Show us what relationships we've canceled. Show us what people we've written off. Help us, help us, help us to be people of love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.